Welcome back. This is Larry Benko, W0QE, and this is the 50th video. Wasn't sure I'd ever make it this far when I started. Nevertheless, this uh, video is about some commonly asked questions I've received in the last month or two, and I thought I would uh, go over them for the um, benefits of other people who probably have the same questions. Let's begin with some non-SimSmith questions that I get. I don't get the first question too often, but I've had it maybe a dozen times. And the complaint is that the videos are fuzzy and the text is hard to read. All the videos I've created have been rendered at 1920 by 1080, 30 frames per second, and at that resolution, the text is very readable. I upload to YouTube at that same resolution, and they re-render the video into several, several different resolutions. YouTube may serve a video to you at some resolution which may not be acceptable, uh, based on some algorithm. And let's look at that for a moment. If I bring up a browser and go to my YouTube channel and just play like the last video, and I've got the audio muted for the moment, YouTube comes up, at least in my machine, in this mode here where I see the... the uh, title block at the bottom and, and some stuff, and I see the header here, not full screen mode. If I look right now at what's being played, and, I, and to me the text is a little bit fuzzy. Looking at this, this is a little hard to read. I can see that they're serving this up to me at 720p. And I have my YouTube setting in auto at the moment. These are the resolutions that they can serve it up to me in, and 1080p will look great. However, they didn't choose to give me 1080p. I can force them to give me 1080p, but in general, what I would suggest you do is not look at, don't look, look at the video in this resolution. Look at it in a full screen mode. In that mode, let me look again here. They're still serving it up to me in 10, in 10 uh, excuse me, in 720p. Um, let's see if I move back and forth like this, maybe. Now they've moved to 1080p. It takes them a few seconds sometimes when you change the screen size for them to give you the um, better resolution. You can always go in here and say force it to be the better resolution and that will help but in my opinion the best thing you can do here is to use as much of the screen as possible. If, as soon as you move your mouse away from away from the area the um, uh, YouTube uh, overview goes away. And this is in this case, I can read everything quite well, and hopefully you can too. If you have a screen that has lower resolution than the screen than this screen has, uh, you may have a problem. I would encourage you to look at full look at the videos in full screen on a screen that has as much resolution as you have as you can get, and see if you still have the problem. While we're at it, let's mention this, and that's closed captioning. Closed captioning is kind of a scary thing, but YouTube is incredibly good at doing getting it right. It makes mistakes. Um, Pretty, uh, pretty right, not is really, uh, I did Z not, and uh, they obviously didn't quite get that right. But um, it's a pretty good, um, <laughs> it's amazingly good act actually, for closed captioning. And you can do um, language translation with it too. So if you're watching this and your primary language is something else, um, maybe that will help if I use words that um, you're not familiar with. Anyways, um, that's my suggestion for the um, for the fuzzy videos. If you get to a point where you're at wit's end and you can't figure out how to get this to look right, offline download is always an option. Now, YouTube doesn't really natively like that or support it, but there's several several downloaders are available as browser add-ons or as standalone programs. I use a program a standalone program, but uh, I won't even mention what it is because every time I go look for these things, there's a different group of them. But they work for a while and then sometimes they stop working and you need to get a new one. But pretty much what they do is they capture the URL of the video. Whether you give it to the program or they automatically can capture it from YouTube, I, I don't know. But you, when you do this, they offload offline download the program and then they give you an MP4 file on your machine that then you can play. Now, if you want to play that MP4 file, you will need a player for it. And if that's the case, I would suggest something like VLC. That's Victor Lima Charlie. Just do a, 
a Google search for VLC player, you'll see that millions of people in the world use it. It plays uh, files very well, but you already, you already may have some MP4 player on your machines. You wouldn't need that. But this is like a last recourse, uh, but it is, a, it is a recourse. I've tried it several times and it works just fine. And if I was going to um, count on a YouTube connection somewhere and I was going to be someplace wasn't sure I would have internet connectivity, doing, doing this would be, a, would be a solution. The next thing is the YouTube like, subscribe, notifications. Um, the chances of a video that I produce being a little channel and not with very many subscribers being recommended to people on YouTube searching for topics like I like these videos have in them is low and increase the chances of me getting of YouTube um, giving serving up that video as a choice to somebody is dependent upon a lot of things but more subscribers and more likes of the video um, increase the chances. Beyond that, I don't know the algorithm or anything else. Now that brings up another point. To be able to subscribe, to subscribe, to be able to comment or anything, you need a YouTube account. And let me go back and do this one more time. This time I'm going to bring up a private window, private browsing window. I'm doing this in Firefox, but you can do it in any in any any browser. They all have private viewing. Now when I go to YouTube, it will no longer know who I am. So instead of being served up things that I normally would look for, I'm served up the generic stuff. And I would think most people would find the generic stuff to be not what they wanted. But nevertheless, at, at this point, I can search for, for, my, for my channel. And you get some videos that are in the channel, and you also get the basic channel here, here which has got my... Larry Benko. Let me mute that again or stop it. And here I can't subscribe because it knows, um, well, I can say subscribe. It doesn't know that I'm that, that I'm, the, that I'm the owner of the channel or it doesn't know that, that and you can't subscribe to your channel. But it, 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 since it doesn't know what I am, let's click on subscribe and it'll say sign in. I need an account to sign in. If I've already got a Gmail account, you're good to go. If you don't have one, you can use another email account or something, and it'll ask you um, some questions. And this is all aimed at keeping the computer-generated bots from being able to, um, you know, wreak havoc. They want to know that the people are real. Um, if you have a problem with doing this kind of stuff, pick a different e pick a different email account. Uh, create a new Gmail account. I've got about six or seven of them. I use for different purposes and you can you know they want your name and everything else and they I don't know how well they check they want a phone number generally for the for recovery of password but um, when you once you get into this you can name yourself something different it's not your name you can name name yourself all, all kinds of things I look at subscribers to my channel and I see some of them have their real names and a lot of them have aliases and some pretty clever names to say the least but anyways if you do this then you have the option my name is Larry Benko my am you have the option when you watch a video this is Larry Benko W you have the option then of being able to subscribe to the channel and if you are subscribed you have the option of clicking on the bell which means you'll get notified when I produce a video you have the option of liking or disliking a video you have the option of making comments and the only feedback I get on the videos are comments and likes. If you dislike something, rather than click this, make a comment and tell me what you dislike. Or contact me directly. That's fine, too. Um, I get some comments periodically about people who, who would like me to go slower. I get comments about people who would like me to include different topics. It's hard to know what topics to include and at what level. But uh, that's the only way I know if uh, people are enjoying uh, what I've been doing so far. Let's finish this up real quickly. Um, why do I make the videos? I get that asked. A I get asked that a lot. When I was a kid growing up, the internet didn't exist, and I would have loved to have been able to find out about these topics, the magazines and books that were available, um, and had people touting that they knew what was going on. Uh, the information was a little bit sporadic, and later on, I learned that a lot of it was not factual. 
uh, something that's 80% factual is also 20% incorrect. And it took a long time to figure all this all this stuff out pretty well. I'm not I'm not the preeminent expert in the world by any means. But this is my way of giving back to the community. This is a hobby for me. I make no money from the YouTube videos. They're not monetized. I don't um, take money from um, subs subscribers or anything. I don't look for money. I don't look for stuff like that. So this is why I do them. I also get a question once in a while, can I use the video for club presentation? And certainly, you can use it if you want. Um, I would appreciate, or I'd, I would expect you would, you would include me as the author, mention the YouTube channel, and then I would appreciate it if you'd drop me a note after, when it was done as to whether you liked it or not or how well it went. But um, that's, perfectly, that's a perfectly good use for, use for the videos. I mean, the goal was to get the, the, knowledge, the knowledge base out there to be increased. I would like to see that in, in general. Now, granted, you can't get to everybody, but if you can get to some percentage of the people, I guess you've done, you know, a good enough job. Now on to the Sam Smith questions. Version 16.2 has been released. And if I bring it up real quickly here, you can go to help, visit website, scroll down, and there's 16.2. You go to Dropbox, you can download whatever files you need for whichever machine you um, currently have. Version 16.1 had a lot of little problems that 16.2 has corrected, and I would recommend that nobody continue to use 16.1. Now, let's talk about what test equipment do I need to buy. People ask me that all the, all the time, and the answer is you don't need to buy anything if you, depending on how you use SimSmith. If you use SimSmith primarily as an educational tool, you can artificially manufacture an impedance that you want to start with. You can design a circuit that does what you want to do. You can measure its perform or you can calculate its performance. You're not measuring it. And you can learn a lot doing that. And I know there are people who use SimSmith for this purpose in this purpose alone. They have no intention of ever building anything. For these people, the biggest uh, piece of equipment that you could have would be a mouse with a scroll wheel. If you do not have a mouse that has a scroll wheel, or if you're using or watching SimSmith videos, or using SimSmith, not watching the videos, but using SimSmith on a tablet, you are losing a huge piece of the experience. For those who are building circuits, I would suspect that the most important piece of equipment you can get be some device to measure component values. Component values are already not accurate to begin with. They come in tolerances. And then if you don't know how to measure them, or if they're old, they may have drifted or changed a little bit, or they may be unmarked, um, you need to measure the component. Um, Q meter is a nice thing. Some, some component testers can measure Q, some don't. A small VNA, very useful, but you know it, it's a little more cost again. Um, soft um, spectrum analyzer, software defined radio, software defined radio with decent software can do a lot of what a spectrum analyzer can do. Uh, though some spectrum analyzers come with a tracking generator and an oscilloscope. Oscilloscope is always a good thing to have, and pretty much everybody should have one. And particularly now in this day and age where you can get a four-channel 100 megahertz oscilloscope for like $320 with uh, digital storage. It's uh, kind of um, it's kind of amazing. Anyways, um, it, this the equipment you need is very dependent upon what you're doing with, within SimSmith and what you're using it for. A more pointed question is which VNA is best? I don't really don't know the answer to that question. Um, VNAs come in a couple of different categories, a one, one and a half, and two port versions. A one port version is kind of what you would call an antenna analyzer. It measures impedance, or S11. Uh, a one and a half port analyzer um, is kind of what you would call a low end um, network analyzer, where you have a, a generator port and you have a receiver port. You have one receiver though that can be attached to the, either the generator port or the receiver or the receiver port, and by doing that, you can measure 
S21 parameters or, through, or the through gain of a circuit or through loss of a circuit like a filter. You can also measure impedance. You can't measure them both simultaneously, but you can measure them. And then a full two-port analyzer can do both at the same time. And then there's even something better than that, which is a really big two-port analyzer that can switch the ports around automatically while you're making measurements too uh, without changing the cables. Um, for most people, it's, it's, it's either one port or one and a half ports is what we're dealing with at, at the low end of the range. And if you want to do filters, you need a one and a half port analyzer so you can actually measure the gain and loss of the filter, not just the input um, impedance of the filter. If I was going to buy a little analyzer, I would ask, I would not ask, I would expect a couple features or I wouldn't buy it. The first feature I would expect would be data file export. It's of no, no value. Um, I made a comment to myself years ago that I was never going to buy another piece of test equipment that I couldn't get the, uh, the data out of it to put into some other program. And I'd expect that from a small VNA also. Uh, reference plane calibration. Even the, ref even the analyzers that say they're calibrated to the connector, you put a little adapter um, to measure components on the end of it, you want to be able to calibrate to the end of that adapter. So I'd want that also. The frequency range is the frequency range you intend to do stuff at. It doesn't need to go higher than that, but it needs to do the range you expect to use. And the software cannot be emphasized enough. Uh, the software is what makes the little, little analyzers good. Now, while we're at it, I find a really interesting page. From the rig expert people. Written, it's a couple years old, but it, it goes through, and is, again, this is... Uh, rigexpert.com and it's a short review of antenna and network analyzers and it goes through all the different types of analyzers whether they have diode detectors or whether they have receivers on them a comment I'd make about the diode detectors is if you have diode detectors in your antenna analyzer plan on not being able to use it to measure antennas on 160 meters if you have any AM radio stations nearby unless you I really can calibrate the analyzer through a filter that gets rid of the broadcast stuff, uh, interference. So um, there's a list of these analyzers. Oh, also, most of these analyzers cannot measure the sign of the reactants. They give you an, an amplitude number, but not the sign. Then there's a, I mean, and they go through rig experts that uses log detectors instead of diode detectors. Again, another type of, another type of analyzer. Now we get down here. And we start to get to analyzers that really have some good performance. And this is kind of how the real, um, net, uh, the real um, VNAs work. They have a directional coupler and they have some receivers. And you can get I and Q out of this, basically. And it has good rejection of, of uh, signals that are out of band that would interfere with a diode detector. The array solution analyzers work that way. The DG, DG8SAQ analyzers a couple other ones, but he goes on and on and on, and this is kind of interesting reading. So um, the analyzer you buy, who knows, it, it varies on a day-by-day -day basis as to, um, you know, what's available and stuff, but uh, again, the software kind of rules the world, and you'd like to, if I was buying one, I'd buy one that had at least a reasonably active user community. Now here's a question that I get more often than I would have ever expected. I've got a design now. What, am I, what can I do with it? And the question is, SimSmith mo models the design that you actually have in the circuit, nothing else. You probably need to simulate the real circuit you're going to build and the real parts you're going to use. The real parts become an issue because parts are not available in all values. Even if the values they're avail available and they have tolerances on them, and let's skip over to let's let's skip this for a minute and go to this go to this real quickly. Okay, there's these E series of preferred numbers. They appeared in the 1950s, and most manufacturers follow them. And a lot of power components do not. If we look at the values for these things, 20% components would only come in values of 1, 2.2, 4.7, and then 10, 22, 47, and then 100, 220, 470, and then 1,000, etc., etc. You only need three values per decade 
with plus or minus 20% tolerance. And then you come up with six values per decade. There's values in between these values. Then we come up with 12 values per, per decade, 24, 48, and 96, and 192, which these are not very common. But you go and you look on a website like Digikey, Farnell, you know, any Mauser, any of those people, and you'll see capacitors when you go look at the data sheet, and they may come in all these values. But then you go look what to see what the menu, what the uh, distributor has in stock, and he only stocks these values. So um, that's, and it's even worse if you go and buy 5% parts, and they're available in all these values per decade, and they only stock, again, these. The others are available, and if you work for some company and you're building something that's a real product, you wait and you order reels of those parts and everything's fine. But as far as if you want something right now today, what's in stock is not these values, but these values, and that's a um, that brings up a couple a couple interesting points. Um, if I go look at somebody like DigiKey here, and I look for one percent capacitors, these are now these are all small capacitors, fifty volt capacitors. They're all COG NPO uh, capacitors. Are stable with temperature and stable with frequency and, and DC bias and stuff like that, and they're cheap. They're thirteen cents a piece. If I go by, let's go, let me see, did I, let's click, let's click on one of these. So let's go to, here's a 270 picofarad capacitor, 1%, 1% value uh, tolerance. And let's go look at the data sheet for, or the, not the data sheet, but the um, description of it. It's um, 13 cents a piece for one. It's 94 cents for 10. You might want to buy, you know, a, a bunch of them. But if you were to go buy, Again, looking at all these values that they have, and, you, and, and it, goes, it goes on and on for pages after pages, what they have is pretty much the E12 values. But if you were to go buy, let's just say a 10 picofarad capacitor with 1%, and then maybe, oh, a 47, a 100, a 220, a 470, a 1,000, and about the biggest capacitor I think they sell, they sell in 1% of is like 2,000 or 3,000 picofarads, and one of those, you could use those little capacitors as standards for a cheapy little capacitance meter to see how accurate it was. These are all 1% parts. That would mean you'd at least be within 1% on your little um, capacitance meter. And that might not be... Um, I, I do this. I've got a bunch of little capacitors that are I've accumulated over time, and I've measured them on a more accurate equipment, and, and they become standards for things if I want to check and see if stuff is working, uh, you know, working correctly. So, um, anyways, let's go back, back to here. So, standard component values and tolerances, that is, at best, they're an annoyance. They force you to change your design to, you, to be within their values, and then your design has to be tolerant of what tolerances those, those um, components actually have. So let's do an example uh, that uh, shows that. So now let's look at a circuit which solves a problem that I've defined. I've got a 10 megahertz signal source here, which has a lot of harmonics in it, and I want to clean it up to the output. 50 ohm input, 50 ohm output, and I built this circuit. It's a pi, it's a pi filter, low pass pi, with the inductor being resonated at the third harmonic. So at 10 megahertz, we see a pass band of minus 0.14 dB, which is good. At the third harmonic, we see a nice notch. And at the fifth harmonic, we see the circuit being down 33.7 dB. I wanted the third harmonic to be down at least 40 dB, and I wanted the third harmonic to be down at least 30 dB. And this meets the circuit very nicely. It's three capacitors, one inductor. None of them are standard values. So I can go buy a bunch of different values and start paralleling them to try to achieve these values. If I do that, um, I can come up with a solution. Um, I can also try to change these values to be more standard-like. And let's try to do that. Let's suppose I'm only capable of buying from my vendor a 270 picofarad or a 470 picofarad capacitor 
as the two boundaries on either side of this 353. So let's go over here for a moment and put a and put a 270 in here. It'll, this will give us less attenuation. And we see that the fifth harmonic now is above the 30 dB number. So that's not real good. So let's make this 470 and see what happens. Well, it's good. We're starting to see a little bit more attenuation here, but maybe 0.3 dB is okay. So let's leave those at 470. And now what we need to do is make this inductor be something that's more reasonable. Let's say I can buy a um, 470 nanohenry inductor or a 1 microhenry inductor. So let's put 1 microhenry in, in there and see what happens. And of course I need to set my capacitor since this is not, I didn't lock the frequency, I need to go back here and get my frequency tuned. I'm just, I'm just tuning this manually. Close enough. Now I've got 2 dB of loss in the pass span. Maybe that's too much. This does meet the meet the requirement. Uh, this capacitor is not the right value, so let's let's make these things be exactly what they what they are. I can get a 27 picofarad capacitor, let's say. I get one microhenry, and here would be the circuit I'd build. This would not resonate quite on the right frequency. It'd be off a little bit, but I'd still be in the notch. I'd be way more, way more than 40 dB down. This is way more than 30. This has got a little bit more loss than I'd like. This may be usable. Now, let's suppose I'm buying 10% parts. Since my mouse wheel is already set to just be approximately 10% 10, 10 step changes, for a real quick test, I can just move these components up and down 10%. Now, these are the ones that are the, that are the problem, the ones in the notch. The, and it doesn't fail, but it, we're, we're, the notch is getting out of, out of the range of what we, where we'd like it to be a little bit. We might be able to make this circuit work. But a lot of times, there are easier circuits to do than one that's been tuned and tweaked. Tuning and tweaking them means you either need to put a variable component in there or you need to have better accuracy at your measurement of the components and then you need to stack a few, a few components together to get the right value. And so let's try another circuit. Now this circuit is two pi networks in, ser in series. I showed these as two separate capacitors, but we would obviously lump these together. So let's get rid of this capacitor. This is the first circuit. This is the second circuit. These two capacitors in parallel. We'll get rid. We'll get rid of this capacitor and make this value 666.6 .6 picofarads. And that'll give me the same circuit I had just a minute ago. Now I've got good passband loss. My third harmonic is down 50 dB. My fifth harmonic is down even more. And these values, again, are not standard values. But what can I do with these values to make to, to see if they're going to be standard? Well, let's go back to our 270 values and, and see, see how, those, how those would work. And I'm going to put the, make this 540. I'm going to parallel two capacitors in here to get five to get the so I buy four, four capacitors, so I get a little bit better deal. I use, I'm sorry, I buy, I buy four 470 picofarad capacitors. Actually, I buy probably 10. And I use four of them in here. These are two paralleled, two one microhenry inductors. And now I have low passband loss, a tenth of a dB. Third harmonic is done 46 dB. Fifth harmonic is done plenty. This circuit's good. Now, if I change this 10%, what happens to my circuit? Very little. Change this 10%. Not too much. And we see that, we see that our changes don't really affect us as much. What we really want to look here is at 30 megahertz. So let me put the let me put the dot at 30 megahertz just for the moment. Oops, missed.
There we go. So we're 46 dB down, and let's see how bad it would be if all the components were off. So we get the le least attenuation when these components are all on the low side. And even if they're all off by 10%, I'm still 41 dB down. So this circuit, I can buy the components. I don't need a component measuring um, piece of equipment and I'm probably good to go. So this circuit, the downside to it was it had one more inductor, but it was a standard value inductor and I did not need to make the components um, paralleled and in, in series and stuff to get the right values. So in this case, this looks like a more appealing circuit. So SimSmith can help us pick the right components and help us build a circuit that is more palatable to, um, you know, what your requirements are. If your requirements are you're going to have to buy parts, buying a fewer number of parts is good. If your requirements are that you have to fit in an existing space, maybe the extra inductor would hurt you. It's hard to say, but this circuit to me is a, is a better circuit. Now, combine your knowledge of what components are available, what components you have in stock, if you have some, um, the voltages and currents on all the components have to be considered too. Now, in a case like this, we don't have to consider them really because this is considered to be a you know it's a it's a it's a small it's a small amplitude um, generator, and if we look at the voltages and currents on these parts, we see them being things like 100 and 100 milliamps, 200 milliamps. So these little components can handle that, and the voltages are seven volts, eight volts. So Service mount parts will work here just fine, and even service mount inductors. Service mount inductors that may have cues that are lower. Let's just do that for a moment. And all we'll see is that this 0.1 dB loss went to 0.2 dB of loss. And 0.2 dB of loss is, is still not very much. We have enough of a, a range over the knee here. We don't, um, when the components are become large, they don't hurt this. Um, we have enough of a range down here that when the components become small, we don't um, go above what our what our um, uh, attenuation uh, requirements were at the third and fifth harmonics. So this is a better circuit. So we can use SimSmith in a lot of clever ways to build stuff up very quickly. And um, hopefully this um, answers some people's questions as to you know where you go afterward. I can, can include this kind of stuff in more designs that I do. And this is a piece that's a very necessary piece when it comes to actually building the, uh, the circuit that you want to build. And in conclusion, let's talk about the last, the last comment here. And this comment is kind of a scary comment. That early, and I've had it by two people now. But earlier videos produce slightly different results than the current videos do. So people who are watching uh, or newcomers to the channel who are watching some of the early vid earlier videos, but they're using version 16 or version 15 are getting slightly different answers than I got when I used version 14. And this is due to some small tweaks that have been done to transmission lines. And transmission lines are notoriously hard to model perfectly when you consider things like SWR and all that other stuff on them. And, and frequency, the velocity factor changes with frequency. I mean, it all kinds of stuff go on and on. So um, let me just do a real quick, real quick example of that. Here's an, here's an example that was brought to, my, uh, brought to mind. And this is version 14.11n. 14.11n is what I used for the basic series, the, the early videos I did. 100 ohm resistor, 33 foot piece of simplified model coax with the, with the standard default values. We started 100 ohms, 33 feet at 10 megahertz is just slightly more than a half wavelength. And we get an impedance here that's 97.2 minus J2.86. So let's look at what we would get if we did this in version 15.1. In version 15.1, we get 96.9 minus 5.43. Between version 14 and 15, the simplified model had been changed a little teeny bit. 
Now, what would it take in the simplified model to make it match the other, uh, what we got in version 14? Well, if we take this length here, we make it like 32. Um, eight feet that's pretty darn close so we take 0.2 feet off of this piece of coax and we get the we get the same result now I'm not sure what to take out of that that's less than a half a percent change or it's just about a half a percent change in either case um, they will both give the same results if we set the loss as the loss gets as the loss gets lower and lower and lower, they become closer and closer. They become the same for the different versions. Uh, this was a tweak that obviously was put in because uh, due to some uh, some people were working on measuring coax, and the simplified model that Ward has produced, which is try tries to be the easiest piece of coax to, or piece of transmission line to use, is a constant battle to get it exactly correct I, I from what i understand anyways that's that's what the difference is from it's not due to, no other components do this just transmission lines are the only ones that i know that that have been tweaked and if we look at version 16.2q it works the same as version 15. it's got 96.9 minus 5.45 so that small change in the simplified model is what produces the um, slightly different results. Hope that doesn't fool too many people or cause them problems. Um, it's really tough to know what the real answer is. Um, somebody would have to measure a lot of different pieces of coax at a huge number of SWRs and various links and all this other stuff to try to get this to be really right. And even then, I'm not so sure you could build up the model that would be that would be perfect. Nevertheless, there are better models in SimSmith for transmission lines, although they probably aren't correct either. Um, all these are just approximations. And even if they were correct, when you buy transmission lines, uh, they have tolerances on them just like regular components have. And the tolerances are things like um, the uh, surge impedance, Z0, and the velocity factor. And that's determined by the dielectric constant. It's determined by the machine that wound the braid on, how tight it wound it. I mean, all kinds of things like that, but they vary a little bit. And I've looked at pieces that have been very accurately cut off different reels, and I can see slight differences. They're not, they're not a lot, but you can see differences. Anyways, I thought I'd do this video to try to address some questions that I've gotten recently, and uh, hopefully this clears up some stuff. Thank you very much.